After hanging up the phone, Sturbina asked, Did you hear all that? Skliarov was shocked. Then came the only words he could spill out his mouth. You can't restore the reactor, because there is no reactor. It no longer exists. Boris looked at him with disgust. You're a panicker, Sherbina said. Hello guys, this episode is probably the last one on this subject for some time. Don't worry, we will get back to it, but it's good to change something a little bit. Maybe there will be one additional episode, it all depends on how today's video will manage to finalize the part of the Chernobyl story we have planned to cover in this miniseries. So what's going to happen today? To remind you quickly, in the 8th episode I described to you the first actual readings in Pripyat. They were made quite early, yet the decision makers in both Pripyat, so the government commission, and Moscow, the Gorbachev cabinet, didn't consider them as important. In episode number 9, I explained better why they waited so long to evacuate people from what is now known as the Chernobyl exclusion zone. I told you about the Mayak accident from 1957 and why was it so important to the Soviet procedures regarding nuclear accidents. The previous episode covered the probable causes and motives of the people in charge who could have made the decision to evacuate civilians, but didn't do it. I think these are the most terrible reasons, and it's good that you watched the previous videos to get a better context of what I will say today. So, let's start, guys. The People of Chernobyl Part 10 The Leader, The Panicker and the Courier Party Man. Pripyat was created out of nothing. It was an Atomgrad, a Soviet nuclear city run by different rules than other places. No one on the higher political levels was surprised that it was quickly cut off from the regular grid. No news, no radio broadcasts, no phones coming in or out of the town. On Saturday, several hours after the explosion in Chernobyl nuclear power plant happened, Militia was already creating road blockades. By nightfall, all Pripyat went silent. The citizens couldn't even call each other as the local phone lines were cut off too. Nonetheless, the KGB was looking closely at everything that was happening there. Some of them had come into the town moments ago. Some of them had been there for months or years already. Despite the almost total lockdown, the head of the government commission sent to Pripyat Boris Sherbina knew that there was nothing that could hide the potential evacuation of the whole city. It was around 50,000 people there. No one could guarantee that this exodus would remain a secret. As a career party man, Boris knew the political outcome it would bring, an international scandal, as the evacuation would be a clear sign that something bad happened at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Even though the deputy minister of health in Moscow argued that the radiation levels were not high enough to evacuate citizens of Pripyat, the specialists on the side knew otherwise. Civil defense commanders and the physicists sent to Chernobyl were clear. The deputy minister was wrong. Even if the levels didn't rise, there was also little hope for them to drop. The radioactive clouds were traveling north-northeast towards Belarus. 50 kilometers, so about 30 miles away, the registered external dosages of radiation were as high as 30 rentgen per hour. And it was only by noon on Saturday, less than 12 hours after the accident. 30 rentgen is an equivalent of 280 millisieverts. The safe annual dose of background radiation varies from country to country, but usually it's around 2, 2.5 millisieverts per year. The 30 rentgen an hour means that you need to stay in that place for 10 and a half hours to get enough radiation to have a 50% chance of surviving. 18 hours would mean that you'd probably live for a month. 36 hours would mean that you'd survive no longer than for a few weeks. And that was 30 miles away from Pripyat. The radioactive cloud was drifting, so the radiation was not the same in different places and times but it was enormously high nonetheless. The situation of the citizens was unlikely to improve. Every hour of waiting meant more deaths, or 
in the best case scenario, serious sickness and long-term health loss. But the weather could change. Hours after the accident happened, there were already storms approaching Pripyat from the southeast. The rain they were about to bring would fall carrying the radioactive particles. That would mean the situation of the city's population would change drastically, and not for their benefit. But there were people that at least did some preparations. The Ukrainian Prime Minister would not make the call to evacuate people, but despite that, he gave orders to arrange transport. More than a thousand buses were getting ready even though the order to evacuate Pripyat hadn't yet come through the party decision makers in Moscow. In the city itself, the government commission led by Sherbina was still gathering information. Boris had the authority to give the order of evacuation, yet he didn't want to do it. He knew there would be consequences even if he was right. Nobody could defy the will of the Soviet Union. At that moment, when the night was settling in Pripyat, he decided to wait for more information. To wait until Sunday morning. At the same time, at about 8 p.m. on Saturday, the reactor reminded of itself yet again. The deputy chief engineer for the science of the power plant noticed something that made his blood run cold. He saw a ruby glow beneath the ruins. The light was getting out even despite parts of Unit 4 building debris covering it. If that wasn't enough, several small explosions followed and generated extremely intense flashes which could be seen from far away. Two hours have passed and another dangerous situation happened. A team of experts led by one of the OPAS members, special unit under the command of Boris Prushinsky, was taking samples from the Coulomb Canal when they heard something like if a thunderstroke just beside them and the Unit 4 building started to shake immensely. By pure luck, they avoided being hit by pieces of building debris and the reactor core by getting into the cover immediately. Meanwhile, the government commission was discussing possible solutions. To some of the people present at that meeting, witnessing these discussions was an experience taken from a lucid dream. Even though there were lots of signs that the situation was critical, the assistant of Sherbina was drafting a plan to repair reactor number 4 and another plan on how to reconnect it to the Soviet power grid. Even the radiation readings taken hours before, which were getting worse hour by hour, suggested that there was something more dangerous than just an unexpected water tank explosion. Further investigations by different teams on the ground were reporting disturbing findings. Despite that, here they were, sitting in Pripyat, close to a huge ionizing radiation source, listening about how to reconnect the reactor back to the grid. And they had in mind that probably there was nothing to reconnect anymore. Vitaly Skliarov, Ukrainian Minister of Energy, resembled later that sometime during one of those unreal meetings, a staff member interrupted to tell Sherbina that Gorbachev would call him shortly. Everyone started to leave the meeting to give him a private space for a talk with the leader of the Soviet Union, but Boris stopped Sklyarov telling him to stay and listen. The hierarchy was a bit confusing by then. On one hand, Sklyarov had his supervisors, and Sherbina had his own. But on the other hand, Sherbina was a lot more influential and important since he was appointed by Gorbachev to lead the commission in Pripyat. Boris told Vitaly, Listen to what I'm going to say. Then you're going to tell your superiors exactly the same thing. The phone rang and Sherbina answered. He reported to Gorbachev. Panic is total. Neither the party organs, the secretary of the oblast, nor the Ryan committees are here at present. I'm going to demand that the Minister of Energy restart all units. We're going to take all measures to liquidate the accident. He then turned to Skliarov and asked, Did you hear that? Skliarov was shocked. Then came the only words he could spill out of his mouth. You can't restore the reactor, because there is no reactor. It no longer exists. Boris looked at him with disgust. You're a panicker, Sherbina said. I've seen it with my own eyes, Boris Yevdokimovich, Sklyarov reminded him again. When Sherbitsky, the Ukrainian Communist Party chief, rang a few minutes later, 
Sherbina repeated exactly the same words which he used when talking with Gorbachev. Sklyarov knew that this plan was hopeless. It was rather a fantasy than a real call to action. So when Boris gave him the phone, he said to Sherbitsky, I don't agree. We need to evacuate people. Within a fraction of a second, Boris Sherbina turned red on his face and became enraged. How dare Sklyarov defy his command? What does he think? How can he contradict anything the Gorbachev already sanctioned? Sherbina snatched the phone from Sklyarov's hand and yelled at Sherbitsky. He's a panicker. How are you going to evacuate all these people? We will be humiliated in front of the whole world. Politics mixed up with everyday life and every aspect of the state to an unimaginable extent. The Soviets were more afraid of being humiliated, whatever they meant by this, than to guarantee the safety of their own people. That's basically how it worked in the USSR. Don't ever stick your head above your position, or you will lose your head, if not worse. However drastically this may sound, that was a sad reality for the Soviet Union citizens. If you have any questions, write us in the comments. We also would love to hear your suggestions for new topics. We will prepare more videos about particular groups of people or even individual characters involved in the Chernobyl disaster, but we would be grateful if you could write which subject would you like to see the most. But that's it for today, guys. Take care. Stay safe. And see you next week. <laughs>